John, none of the lawyers will represent him. Will you? You're his last hope. Here are the most hated people in town. They had shot unarmed civilians in the street, killing five of them, wounding half a dozen others who will die within 10 years. They deserve to have a jury weigh what they had done. And they deserve to have the presumption of innocence. That is the essential thing here. Boston in the late 1700s was a town in decline. Bostonians can turn out a mob and seemingly a moment's notice to protest, to hang a stamp collector's effigy from a tree. By the time of the Stamp Act in 1765, John Adams was the go-to lawyer of the Liberty Party. And he is part of the social world that is part of being political in 18th century Boston, who become known as the Sons of Liberty. In the summer of 1768, there are a number of protests, street protests, some of them kind of loud, some of them a little rowdy, in Boston against the people who were sent to Boston to collect these new taxes. No more taxes. Down with the crown. We want representation. The governor wants military backup to protect the customs agents who are coming to Boston in 1768 to collect taxes. For actual crowd control, what the British tended to use were regiments of soldiers during peacetime. Now one of the most adamant against having this intrusion of British force is Samuel Adams. So for him, the arrival of troops in Boston was a clear indication that the British Empire had just lost its way. John Adams was a little more willing to be like, well, this doesn't look good, but let's see what it ends up being. Their cousins, they, but they are from different branches of the family. Their approaches to success were sometimes, sometimes at variance with each other. Now, the real trouble seems to start in February of 1770. You killed him! He was just a boy! And some of the townspeople are starting to carry weapons, knowing, hey, I'm gonna get even with one of these soldiers. The soldiers are targets. Monday morning on the 5th of March, someone posts a notice around town saying, citizens of Boston, stay off the streets if you know what's good for you. Signed, soldiers of His Majesty's 14th and 29th Regiment. A warning to Bostonians. We don't know who posted this. I'm pretty sure it wasn't the soldiers of His Majesty's 14th and 29th Regiment. The night of March 5th was very cold. There was a foot of snow on the ground. The British had posted a lone sentry in front of the Customs House on King Street in Boston. A couple of apprentices come along and see here's one soldier. So they decide to have some fun with him. They start taunting him, calling him names. White's telling them to go home, and he's trying to protect himself with his gun, and he pushes and one of these kids falls to the ground. And it's just at that moment, the crowd that had been trying to attack the barracks comes around the corner. The sentry called for help. Uh, he called to the main guard to support him because the people coming had clubs and chunks of ice uh, as big as a fist. And this was looking dangerous. Someone goes up to the custom, goes up to another barracks across from the townhouse to alert the officer of the day that the sentry in front of the customs house is about to get killed by the mob. And, you know, Benjamin Franklin had said that sending troops to keep the peace in Boston is like setting up a blacksmith's forge in a gunpowder magazine. As anyone who knew Boston knew that sending troops there would not be a recipe for peace. 
So Captain Thomas Preston, who's the officer on duty, assembles seven soldiers into a squad. As those soldiers come marching up the street, they see a number of other Bostonians whom they know pretty well. Things get louder and louder. People start shouting. Boston, I think it's worth remembering, has no street lights at this point either, so it's quite dark. Church bells started to ring. Church bells in Boston meant a fire. People started pouring into that area, hundreds of people. But it was pretty clear that there was no fire. Crispus Attucks, who is an African-American, Native American sailor, comes down Corn Hill leading a group of other sailors. He's carrying two clubs. He hands one to a bystander, says, let's go get him. And Attucks and his group push themselves to the front of the crowd, right in front of Private Montgomery. And Attucks then is wrestling with Montgomery, trying to get his gun away from him. Then there are people who claim that they heard the captain shouting at the soldiers, fire. Fire! All we know is that at some point, soldiers do fire. And when the smoke clears, they see three people dead in the snow, another handful who are injured, some of whom actually are injured for the rest of their lives. Shame on the British. Samuel Adams immediately sees the potential for this. The town of Boston starts hearing witnesses too and very quickly publishes their own account of what happened in what they call the horrid massacre. John Adams recognizes that this is really a seminal event, that there can be any number of consequences. As a lawyer, the real episode is in the next day. There is a lot at stake here. That you have had these soldiers shooting civilians. And this can provoke more trouble. And at this moment, actually, Lieutenant Governor Hutchinson comes on the scene. He also hears a rumor that there are people in the surrounding communities ready to come into Boston and attack the soldiers now in retaliation. The situation was so dire in terms of Captain Preston and the soldiers that there was a serious fear they would be lynched. If Governor Hutchinson had somehow prevented a trial, I think it's almost certain that there would have been serious riots. The rule of law and good order would have broken down completely. We'll have order and we'll have justice. Stay calm. Before the sun is up, he orders Captain Preston and the soldiers arrested for murder. Shortly after the shooting on King Street, when uh, the soldiers and Captain Preston were arrested and were being held pending trial, Adams was approached by a friend of Preston who said none of the lawyers will represent Captain Preston. Almost none of the Boston lawyers wanted to represent these defendants. Josiah Quincy did agree to represent them, if John Adams also would when a Boston merchant in Forest, he's actually Irish, calls on Adam saying, here's a man in prison, not a friend in town, going to be put on trial for his life and he can't find a lawyer. And Adams, the lawyer, says that in a free country, counsel is the last thing that any man on trial for his life should want. That the bar ought, in my opinion, to be independent and impartial at all times and in every circumstance. Well, he says to Forrest, you can expect neither art nor address, but only attention to the facts. And then Forrest says, but of course, you know, he is not guilty. And John Adams says, that is for the jury to determine. John Adams realized that this trial was crucial because his ultimate goal was to make sure that the Americans were self-governing. And he understood that the way to do that was not by mob rule. So John Adams and Josiah Quincy agreed to represent not only Captain Preston, but the soldiers, who are going to be tried separately.
There were three main reasons why Captain Preston and the soldiers thought that they wouldn't get a fair trial. And the first one was bad publicity. Paul Revere had rushed out with an engraving weeks uh, after the incident called the Boston Massacre that showed the events in a very unfavorable light to the British soldiers. The second reason was that they were concerned the trial would occur very soon after the events, when everyone's emotions were at fever heat, and they wouldn't be able to calmly consider the evidence. The third reason was they were worried that the jury would be biased against them. Juries in Boston were very uh, anti-British, and especially anti-British soldiers. And so they were quite concerned that all of those factors would affect their trial. John's intention was to bring in people who would look to everyone unbiased. His argument really was that the jury needs to look like the trial, which is absolutely a confidence in law itself and in the rule of law. Here we have a case where the entire population is pretty violently against the British. And so how to get an impartial jury in that circumstance? Adams evidently thought that it would be all right uh, to try to make sure that there were loyalists uh, on the jury. But it does raise an interesting question about uh, how far is too far in terms of uh, selecting the jury to favor your client. The shooting and the retention of counsel occurred in March of 1770, and the first trial didn't start until October. Although Samuel Adams wanted to have a trial right away, the idea of more restrained patriots was that we ought to let things cool down before we start a trial. There certainly are some more radical people, including especially, I think, Sam Adams, who wants to make sure that people understand that the British government had completely overstepped its authority by sending soldiers to Boston. And so there's sort of a tension there about what kind of politics should they be playing with these trials. John Adams was a terrific lawyer because, first of all, he had the real lawyer's temperament in the sense of uh, calmly applying the law and calmly considering the evidence. But he understood that uh, there is an emotional component to arguing and especially to arguing in front of a jury. What he wanted to do was to play on their better nature, essentially, to show them that if there was a doubt that they should acquit. John Adams and Josiah Quincy had a two-part plan. They decided that what they were going to do was separate the trial of the captain from the trial of the privates. The trial for the captain, they decided the defense was going to be a question of whether or not he actually gave an order to fire. The soldiers assumed that their defense was going to be that they were simply following orders. And they say in a petition that they send to the defense counsel, what are we supposed to do? We're just poor privates. And if we didn't follow orders, we would be beaten or possibly shot ourselves. So somehow the defense has to figure out how are they gonna make two somewhat contradictory arguments in two cases that follow each other. And it's completely illogical. In modern times, Adams would not have been permitted to represent the soldiers and Captain Preston. His line of defense in the soldiers' case was that the soldiers were provoked to the point where they feared, legitimately feared for their lives, and so they were justified in shooting. Which is a difficult argument for John Adams and Josiah Quincy as both Sons of Liberties, but really as loyal Sons of Boston to make, because they don't want to start making the argument that Boston is a town that's totally out of control, that's full of mobs, you know, where soldiers should be afraid for their lives. But rather that other people, somebody from Ireland 
and a bunch of what Adams referred to as outlandish jack tars. So what he was saying was, sure, there was a mob in Boston, but it was a mob that was mostly made up of outside people. So don't blame the town of Boston for the rowdiness of the crowd. Now Samuel Adams is sitting behind the prosecution table at the trial, passing notes. He's also finding witnesses that establish that the soldiers had a malevolent motive. He really wants them to be found guilty and hanged. What Adams was able to do was to present to the jury a great deal of evidence to show that the soldiers were in fear of their lives and, as he argued to the jury, they were entitled to take what steps they needed to preserve their lives. At the very end of Adams' argument, uh, he made another very powerful point. And what he said was this, facts are stubborn things, and whatever may be our wishes, our inclinations, or the dictates of our passions, they cannot alter the state of facts and evidence, nor is the law less stable than the fact. So Adams is setting out the conditions for the rule of law. And it's astonishing that under the circumstances, the American colonists actually stuck with it. Peter Oliver, one of the judges, said, when you are considering the evidence, if on the whole you have a reasonable doubt, stay back, you must acquit. And that's the first instance in American legal history of the concept of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Well done. So in the end, John Adams does win for his clients. He does get off almost all of the soldiers and the captain, and he thinks that he did this exactly right. All of the soldiers were acquitted, except two of them, who were found not guilty of murder, but guilty of manslaughter. He does believe that the British Crown needed to be held responsible, not individual soldiers. They're just there as the arm of the empire. He did want to see, as did Sam Adams, they both went to see a different colonial imperial relationship, that they couldn't just treat the colonies any way they wanted to. They understood, I think at some level, that if they did not hold fair trials in these cases, what they were fighting for would be jeopardized. Samuel Adams was in many ways a rabble rouser. Uh, he always led the mobs. Uh, and uh, so even in, in these cases, uh, you know, he was present and he was very vigorously uh, fomenting anti-British sentiment. But he never objected to his cousin representing these defendants. The lasting impression, I think, on American law is that a lawyer who represents an unpopular client is doing what lawyers are supposed to do, which is pursuing justice. Samuel Adams and John Adams, it's an interesting dynamic, interesting relationship, as they're not always on the same side politically, but they always are on the same side in the terms of defending liberty seeing different ways to do this. And the massacre trial is really one of these great examples of different ways of establishing a government of laws and not of men. Rules of law should be universally known. Whatever effect they may have on politics, they are rules of common law, the law of the land. John Adams.